now for the next material. This may seem kind of a surprise, but it's still going to be based on limits and things like that. Um, but it's going to seem awful different. You've covered these in your life, probably in a pre-calculus class or something like that. <clears throat> so let me just start on it. Uh, a sequence. Underline, that's the term. Is any function with the natural numbers as a domain. So generally speaking, we'll do something like, uh, as, as an example, I might write f of n equals n squared. And then, so it's not quite the same as x squared. It is n, meaning I'm only going to be plugging in whole numbers in there. Well, numbers starting at 1, 1, 2, 3, etc. And you can make yourself a, a list of values. So for if I put in n equals 1, then fn is 1. If I put in n equals 2, then fn is 4, because 2 squared is 4. n is 3, fn is 9, n is 4, fn is 16, etc., etc. If you were to go through the effort of graphing this, it might look something like this. We'd have like 1, 2, 3, 4, and then the y values, of course, would be 1, and then 4, and 3 would go way up there. So you get the idea. You've seen stuff like this before. If, if, if I had the function y equals x squared, it would come here and, and connect those dots. But we're only talking about the whole values of n right now. We're not talking about a continuous function per se. Um, We're interested in, in what might be called the end behavior of these things. So I would like to know, as I plug in different values of n, is there, a, let's put it this way, is there some sort of a limit as n gets bigger and bigger and bigger? So what we want to do for this to analyze, I can start and do this stuff, f, n, and f, n, and plug in my numbers. So if I plug in 1, I'll get 1 over 6. And then 2, I'll get 8 over 41. This this really isn't doing much for me. And that's going to be time consuming as all, as you couldn't believe. So instead, let's throw this thing into the calculator and let it do its work and let it do the work for us. As I was originally going to say, you're going to have to probably put this as execute, uh, which you'd call a continuous variable, but then just work with the whole numbers after that. Now let me do this again. I'm going to table set and I'm going to start at 1000. I'm going to leave it at incrementing 1 and let's take a look at the value. Now if I do this it's going to go 1000, 1002, so it's still going to do the integers. Um, hit second and then graph. Now it's a lot faster. So this numerical evidence suggests that point 0.2 is the limit. So I might say the limit as n goes to infinity, n cubed over 5, n cubed plus 1 equals 0 0.2. Indeed, if you go into the graph of this thing and put for the second thing, uh, 0 0.2 with the graph. The graph will go and tend to it. Um, I don't think zoom 6 is the way I want to go because that's such a small thing, but I'll do that for now to graph it. Here's my thing, and it's hard to really see anything here because the numbers were all so small. So what I'm going to do is change my y values um, from 0 to, I'm going to say 0 0.4. 
four. That should give me a, a, a room to operate on. Let me look at the graph right now. There's my function. And there's that. Uh, this thing that came across was um, y equals 0 0.2. And it's hard really to see this. In fact, most of the action seems to be happening around 0.2. So let me change my window even further. I think maybe I will go from 0.1 to 0.3. Let me get a better look at this thing. I know it's between those two values most of the time. There it is again. There it comes. It's really hard to see, but what happens is this graph is definitely tending to 0 0.2. So let me draw this out. What you're having then is for one, I don't know what it was, but you had a dot. Two, you had a dot a little bit higher. For three, you had a dot a little bit higher than that. But then eventually they started to taper off. And the limiting value was 0 0.2. If you drew that as a horizontal asymptote, you could see the graph is approaching that. One way we could check this for sure is we could, we can actually compute this. The only thing that we're going to do here is instead of working with n, I'm going to work with x's because it's that we usually have x being a continuous function, or x is in, or involved with continuous. All right, now what you have here then, I, I don't know if you remember how to do these things, but this would be a good review of it. I noticed that if, if I let x go to infinity, this part goes to infinity and so does the bottom part we called this, the format was a zero over zero limit. So we made use of something called L'Hopital's rule. And usually what I do when I indicate the use of L'Hopital's rule, I'll put an L with a circle around it. I saw this in an old textbook uh, that we used to use, and I always thought it was a good idea so people would know what I'm up to. So using L'Hopital's rule, we know to take the derivative of the numerator I get 3x squared and the derivative of the denominator, 15x squared. Well, you're allowed to cancel these x squareds out when you're talking about limits, and you end up with 3 over 15, which is 1 fifth, which is, of course, exactly equal to 0 0.2. So if this limit exists, what we call a continuous limit, then the one involving natural numbers will have to exist as well. The other way is not true, but this way certainly is. This will often help us. If we can find a limit with a continuous variable, the one that we can take derivatives with, and we actually get an answer, then this one will be that answer. <coughs> Did I use an L there? I'm going to remind people that it was L'Hopital's rule. Incidentally, you may not know this, but L'Hopital wrote the first calculus book ever. That's impressive in itself. Now, when we're dealing with these, we usually, you know, if I write f of n equals n squared, we typically don't use fn. We don't make an appeal to a function. We'll instead say something like a sub n equals n squared. And then, uh, then if you let, you notice that a1 equals 1, a2 equals 4, a3 equals um, 9, you know, basically whatever number is down here in this index position uh, will be the same number that is over here, a4 equals 16, and this goes on forever. So what we might do then is use this notation. I may say a sub n n equals 1 to infinity. So I'm indicating that I'm interested in the values of n all the way starting at 1 and going all the way up through infinity. And the actual numbers themselves, I'll put them in. So this format <clears throat> is the most common version that you'll see that refers to as a sequence. 
So we pretty much drop this F, we don't deal with it that way, instead we use this kind of notation to deal with that. Let me give you a definition. A sequence A sub n, n equals 1 to infinity, is said to converge to L if for every, you're going to love this, epsilon greater than 0, there is an n, and this notation simply means that this capital N is a natural number. So if for every epsilon greater than zero there is an n in n, or a natural number n, such that a sub n minus l is less than epsilon for all n greater than this capital N. I might, this is all well and good. We're not going to do any of this stuff. Although, when I prove a certain limit, I'll probably use this stuff because that's te the technical reason, reasoning behind what we're doing. But all this means is that the sequence terms, they start to hone in on a certain value. Like the one that we just did. And here the limit was 0 0.2. Now, uh, how big? Does n have to be? So that a n minus l is less than 0 0.01. <clears throat> let me make it even more, let me make it 0 0.01. So how big does n have to be so that that is true for all n's thereafter? Well, let's take a look. Let's go back to the calculator to get this sort of stuff. I think it's easiest if, let me, I think I still have it in the y one, let me put it back. All right, and then I've got the point two. Now what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna look at the absolute value between the function and the limit. So click on your math button, move over to NUM and choose the first thing in the list that is the absolute value. And now what I'm gonna do is go to VARS, Y VARS, function, Y1. So that's my A sub N in there. And or you might call it a sub x because of that, but, and then minus y2, I can put point 0.2 here, but I'll show you where it's at. If you had something more complicated in there, you could just write y2 without much effort. And now I want to see when this term y3 gets less than 0 0.001. So I'll do the same thing I did before. I'm going to go back to the table. I'm going to start it at 1 and increment it as such. And then I'll go second table and see what we have here. i got to go over to the Y3 column. And now what I'm looking for is when these numbers drop below 0.001. It's getting, it looks like it's going to do it now. This negative 4, that means that's 0 0.0006. So this, it dropped below here. And if you ask me, it, it looks like these numbers are just getting smaller as we go on and on and on. I think it was way back. Let's go back here. Come back over here. Right there, there's a sub 3 minus L is 0 0.015. So we had the absolute value of a sub 3 minus L was approximately equal to 0 
and then a sub 4 minus L was approximately equal to uh, 3 zeros and then a 6. So it's right here at this point. So for n equals 4 and up, we have a n minus l is less than 0 0.001. And of course, and I made this uh, more zeros in here, the n that would have been required would be higher. It just says for, for there to be uh, a convergence, or what they call a, a, a put, I should underline this, converge to the limit. There's going to be a convergence if at some point the terms start to hug L. And graphically, if you were to draw a graph, it will do something like I had here. It will start to tend toward a horizontal asymptote. Determine the limit as n goes to infinity, 1 plus 1 over n to the n to three decimal places of accuracy. So to determine that to three decimal places of accuracy, I'm going to put that in the calculator again, except I'm going to use x's where the n is. And let me go in here and let me clear everything out. I don't even have an L yet that I'm, I'm thinking of. Uh, let's look at the numbers and see what they tell us. So I'll start with 1 plus 1 divided by x. And we'll take that to the x power. I suppose I could do, look, let's look at a graph and see if it seems to approach anything. So um, let me do zoom. Six, that's just a starting point. Here it comes. Well, I guess it does look like it, it flattens out, doesn't it? Let me, uh, about what, if I trace this, what do we have for our values? Now, I don't care about things between and within, I just care about the integer values. So this is giving me everything and more. The y values, though, they appear to be two point something that they're approaching. As you're going, and keep in mind, I'm nowhere near what is considered long, I mean, near infinite. Uh, let me go back to the table and set it at starting at one and incrementing one again. Let's go ahead and take a look at the numbers that the table produces and see if we can get an accuracy to three decimal places. So, as we suspected, these numbers are getting close. Oh, they jumped past 2.5. Okay, here they go 2.6. So I'm just scrolling down. I wish I could do page down, but you can see it looks like they're not, oh, there's 2.7. I wonder how high this goes. Well, what you can do, if you're wondering about that, let me, instead of do a measly 92, that's nowhere near large when it comes to infinity. Let's start this thing off at 1,000 and see what we get. Now let me look at my numbers. 2.7169. And it looks like that 9 may change soon. 7, 8. And I got a 2.717. See, with, with these, I still don't quite have... I don't have this third place locked in yet. I think I'm pretty good on the 7, 1, but not the nearly the 7. So I'm going to come here and go to my table set, and let's set it at, heck, let's set it at a million. One, two, three, four, five, six. And in fact, this will be fun. I'm going to increment my table by 100,000. This is still, in, in, the turn, in, in the scheme of infinity, these are still tiny little numbers, but nonetheless, let's take a look at what the numbers are dealing, doing for us. 2.71828.
interesting. These numbers kind of oscillate here. I don't see them. I see them going one, two, one, two, one, two. It almost seems like your calculator is kind of messed up. Um, but I think to three decimal places, I got 2.718. So this thing here is approximately 2.718. This is another limit you can do directly it's by hand. Well, once again, let's switch to X notation. And then make use of a trick to do problems like this where the exponent was going to infinity. In fact, you'll remember in the section on L'Hopital's rule, they would look at something like this, and inside of here wants to go to 1, but then this up here wants to go to infinity. So they called it an indeterminate form. Uh, 1 to infinity is what's called an indeterminate form. The reason why is you can't guess the answer as being 1. Because one, it would seem like 1 to infinity should be 1, but it's not. We know from this information that 1 to infinity is something like 2.718. So the way we did problems like this back in the L'Hopital rule days was the first thing you did was rewrite this problem. I'm going to use big letters here, E. The letter E is the Euler's constant, but then you would do natural log. Now this stuff here, starting with the natural log, is all in the exponent. and you would do this operation. Now keep in mind, e to the ln, they cancel, so I get the original thing if I decided not to do anything. Now, that's a lot of stuff in the exponent. Let me write one more step before I fix that part of it. One of the things you should remember is since the natural logarithm is a continuous function, uh, the limit can be on the inside, can drive the independent variable, or the limit could be on the outside. That's one of the definitions, well that's the definition of a continuous function, is that the limit of the function is the function of the limit, i.e. I can bring my limit sim sign out front and inside I'll now have ln 1 plus 1 over x to the x. Now one of the things I've adopted, I, I'm not, I think the book has too, most people do because this is so much stuff going on in the exponent, it's a ridiculous amount of stuff, we might rewrite this as exp, meaning e raised to this stuff. So this is a shorthand notation for it. This also, as I work the problem, I'll keep writing this exp. That'll remind me at the end that my answer is e to whatever number I get. And then one of the things you try to do is get one of those forms that you could work with, a fraction form. First thing you can do is take this x and put it in front of the ln. And now what I'm going to do is the trick that always made L'Hopital work was to do a step similar to this. And the reasoning here is that you're trying to get something that's like 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity. Now, if you look inside of here, these numbers, as x goes to infinity, 1 over x is approaching 0. So this stuff in here is approaching 1. Well, the natural log of 1 is 0. Down here, think of 1 over x. As x goes to infinity, this chunk is going to 0. So what I have is on top of the numerator, on the numerator, I have something going to 0. And down here I have something going to zero. So this zero over zero tells me that this is the perfect time 
to use a L'Hopital rule. <coughs> and if you'll recall, once again, you need to take the derivative of the numerator and the denominator. So let me take the derivative at the top. Natural log, the first thing you do is do 1 over, and then take the derivative of what was inside. So the derivative of 1 plus 1 over x, well, the 1 will go away. This part right here will be negative 1 over x squared. Well, as fate would have it, this down here also is negative 1 over x squared. So this is a nice cancellation. Now I can simply write exp and take the limit. It's ready to go. Um, 1 over 1 plus 0. And that's just 1, so this equals e to the first power, which is e. And those are indeed the first three decimal places of e, the 2.718. This notation that I'm using here is called does not exist. Although the terminology we're going to be using going forward be, do, does not converge, we use does not exist for limits. Um, this here, cosine of n, is not going to exist because if you just plug it in, let's plug it into the calculator. Make sure anytime you do trig related stuff in this class, anything with a trig function, make sure your mode is in radian right here make sure that the radian is highlighted okay, now let me go ahead and put in my cosine x and as before i'm going to start my table at one and increment by one just to get an idea of what it's doing initially so let's go ahead in here look at those numbers does it seem to you, based on this numerical evidence, that this thing is honing in on a value? Let's try big numbers. Let me try the table set at a million as before. One, two, three, four, five, six. You've got to watch. You can easily outrun your calculator's capabilities by going too far on these things. Let's increment by 100,000 and see what my numbers are. See if they're honing in on a value. No, and not only they're not honing in, it's oscillating between positive and negative, and there's no rhyme or reason. It's not like it's positive. Well, here, it, no, see those numbers? Here, they're going low, they're going low, they're going low. Oh, there they go. There, no, 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 they're going the other way now. See, that's the whole problem with cosine, is that they deal with um, its periodicity. It goes up and down and up and down. So if you were to graph, this, if you graph cosine of x, just regular cosine of x, you have something that goes like this. Now, what's happening with us is that, like, we have 1 might be here. This is uh, a1. This here might be a2. Then a3 may be here. a4 may be here. But what you see is these dots are not honing on a value at all. They keep going. And it, you're always going to have natural numbers that are probably not very far away from multiples of pi and things like that. So you're always going to have stuff like this going on with cosine. It's never going to converge because it does not taper off. That's really what we need. It does not taper off to a horizontal asymptote. Try this one. See if you can determine the limit as n goes to infinity of arc tangent of n. So I'm going to throw arc tangent of x into y1, and that's above tangent. There's like a tan to the negative 1. Let's see what it writes. Okay, and that's all I need. Let me just now um, look at the table values. Let me go to the table set. I'm going to start at 1. I'm not really sure why I start at 1, since it's not important what happens there. It's only important when, when the numbers get big. Well, let's take a look at the table values and see if they seem to be approaching anything. Alright, so it looks like it's locking in some decimals here. 
1.55. So let me make the now it so it does look like it's gonna get somewhere. So let's make that oh heck. Let's make it a million. And then let me go down here and make this hundred thousand again. So I'm jumping by a lot. And take another look at the table values. Oh yeah, I'd say now we have it definitely to three places. It doesn't look like this stuff is changing much. Although this nine might creep up and bump that seven. It doesn't look like it's going to get to this this place here because these really remember these are jumping by a hundred thousand. So I would say this is approximately one point five seven one. And indeed, you are supposed to know by now. In fact, the graph of arc tangent is one that you can do just by knowing the graph of tangent. It has a horizontal asymptote at pi over 2 in the positive direction. And then if you went negative, you can. We can do sequences that start at n equals negative 1 or n equals 0 and go backwards if we want to. That is permitted, but we're not doing it in this course. But what happens is it has a horizontal asymptote for negative infinity. And then it comes up here and then hugs pi over 2 as x goes to positive infinity. Now, with that short introduction, let's take a look at something called the series. Here, we try to add up an infinite number of sequence terms. Consider this sequence. I'm going to use k for reasons that will become clear later on. So I'm going to write a sub k equals 3 times 10 to the negative k. Now let's take a look at what a1 equals. a1 equals 3 times 10 to the negative 1, or what would be 0 0.3. a sub 2 equals 0. Point, now you're going to have 3 times 10 to the negative 2, which is 0 0.03 a sub 3 equals a 0 0.003. Well, you get the idea. You can see what's going on here. Well, does this make sense then? Does it make sense to write a1 plus a2 plus a3 dot dot dot? It goes on forever and ever. Does that actually add up to something reasonable to us? Well, let me put the numbers in. I think you think it, I think you can see that it will. that second one up. And this goes on forever and ever and ever. Well, we know that this, if we add it all up, we simply get this. We get 0 0.333, and the threes go on forever. You probably remember this notation where you put a bar over the 3 to indicate that the 3's continue forever and ever. And there's a name for this particular sum of numbers. It's called 1 -third. You would have learned about that in, I don't know where, I think they taught us stuff like this in, like, in elementary school somewhere, whatever the case may be. Um, here, the limit is 1 -third, or you could write this decimal, it's the same thing. So we do have in this case, it makes sense. This sum, if I added up all these things, adds up to one-third. In fact, these kind of fractions were the first time you dealt with things that went on forever. Probably the first time that an infinite idea was suggested in school to you was through these kinds of numbers. So we can write this. I can write from k equals 1 to infinity, a sub k equals 
one third. So this right here, this guy right here, that's called an infinite series. And we're going to go the same as we did before. Um, if s sub n equals, if I sum it from k equals 1, but only up to n, then s sub n is called the nth partial sum. Well, then we define uh, the summation of this whole series to be the limit as n goes to infinity of these s sub n's. Or if you want, it's no different than this. We could write it as the limit as n goes to infinity sum k equals 1 to n of a sub k. Any of these will work. So whenever this limit exists, we say that the series converges. If the limit doesn't exist, we say it's divergent or it diverges. So if the limit does not exist, or is infinite, then the series is divergent. So we're going to be concerned mostly with convergence or divergence. What we're going to do, we're going to do a few sums of these series, but for the most part, the actual, what they actually add up to be is not important so much as we know whether they converge or diverge. That'll be the more important question as we go forward. But for now, let's actually add a few of these up so you can see some of the tricks that are involved. Consider the series k equals 1 to infinity of just k. Well, we would have to look at the partial sums, so let's look at these. s sub n equals k equals 1 to n of k. You may or may not remember this, but the formula for that is n times n plus 1 divided by 2. Well, it's pretty clear then that the limit as n goes to infinity of Sn, which is this limit, n goes to infinity. Well, at the top, this has an n squared in it, so this is going to be infinite. So this series diverges. Now, how about the sum from k equals 1 to infinity of negative 1 to the k? Let's write some of these s to s's down and see what happens. So s1, you're just going to have negative 1 to the 1, so that'll be negative 1. s2, you'll have s1 plus negative 1 squared will be 1. And then s3 will equal negative 1 plus 1. And this time, I am going to put a 3 up here, and I'll get negative 1 to the 3 is negative 1 again. So this adds up to negative 1. And then s sub 4 equals negative 1 plus 1 plus negative 1 plus, if I plug k equals 4, I get a positive 1 again. And that gives me a 0. So it looks to me like my s's. If I were to write my Sn from n equals 1 to infinity 
I get a sequence that looks like this, negative 1, 0, negative 1, 0, and this goes on forever. So what happens is it's not honing down on either 1 or 0. It's oscillating between 1 and 0, so it's not approaching a limit. So once again, this one diverges. So here, this is a sum that, that would never get out of control. It would always be between negative 1 and 0, except that it's not honing in on a value. Here I have a series from 1 to infinity of 1 over k times k plus 2. Let me do the same thing as I did before. S sub 1. That means when k is equal to 1, I'm going to have 1 over 1 times 3. I'm going to have 1 third. S sub 2 equals. Now, I'm going to, you always get the first term, S sub 1, plus, now let me plug in k equals 2. So I'll have 1 over 2. 2 times 4, which will be 8. So I'll have 1 eighth. Now let's take a look and plug in k equal 3. I'll have 3 times 5 will be 15. And when you have 4, I have 4 times 6 be 1 over 24. Well, I can see the denominators, how they're moving up. I went from 5, a difference of 5, then 7, then 9. So the next one must be 1 over 35. Oops, I didn't mean to put it there. 1 over 35, then 1 over 48. You get the idea. Adding these up, I'm not quite getting a feel for what these numbers are supposed to be approaching. I guess I could try to get a common denominator, like this would be, this would be uh, 8 plus 3, that would be 11 over 24. And then this one, oh boy, um, the reason why I'm saying oh boy is because the common denominator is big. You're going to probably have, well I don't have to go, let me say I have to do 24 and 15 probably at 120 because I think 8 times 15 is 120 all right so I'd have uh, 40 over 120 plus 15 over 120 so that's 55 over 120 and then this over here uh, would make it 63 over 120 I believe I'm correct there. I'm just going to do that real quick again. 120 would be 40 plus 15 is 55. And this would give me 8 more, 63. These numbers, even the decimals, I'm not sure are going to do much for me. Uh, unless I see if I could lock them in. You can't plug this into your calculator like this because I'm not so sure it does a sum, an infinite sum of numbers. So one of the things we that's developed for this just this particular kind of series is to rewrite it in the following format. I'm going to rewrite each term as a partial, as a sum of partial fractions. So if you do this, if I do k plus 2 minus k, I'll end up with 2 over k times k plus 2. So the way around that is to put a 1 half here. And now I have this but it's broken up into these pieces. So let me do the same game that I did before. S sub 1 will equal 1 half times 1 over 1 minus 1 third. So that was when k is equal to 1. S2 will equal 1 half will be 1 half minus uh, S when k is 2 I'll get 1 fourth. So I'll have to put an S1 first, and then put in K equal 2, All right, and 
and then S3 will equal one half. I'm just going to rewrite this as one. Here's S2 coming in, and finally S3. When K is equal to 3, I'll have 1 third minus 1 fifth. Well, one thing you should see here is as we continue on, in S3, I would be able to cancel this 1 third with this 1 third. In fact, let me, let me do another one, S sub 4 hammer in the idea. First I got to put in S1. So there's K equal 1. Here comes K equal 2. Here comes K equals 3. And then K equals 4. Getting too excited. Get that out of there. K equals 4. We have 1 fourth minus 1 sixth. And I am seeing a trend here. The one-third will cancel with this one-third. The one-fourth will cancel with this one-fourth. And it looks like we will be left with one-half times one plus one-half times one-half um, plus one-half times negative one-fifth plus one-half times negative one-sixth. Well, this is nice. This, this is a little bit easier to do than all of those, I guess. So I'll have one-half plus one-fourth minus one-tenth minus one-twelfth. And now these things all have um, common denominator of what? Twelve, uh, ten and twelve. What are they going to have in common? 6 to 60 between these two. So I've got to get an LCD of 60. So that'll be 30 over 60 plus 15 over 60 minus 6 over 60 minus 5 over 60. And that will equal 45 minus 11 will be 34 over 60. Hmm. Well, let me, do an, let me do one more and then I'll, I'll do what I, I plan on doing. Let's go on to S5. I'll start to write little. Right here is once again k equals 1. Now I'm moving on to k equals 2. You can always tell the denominator here is always 2 less than the next denominator. Here's k equals 3. I gotta go to 5 for this case. Here's k equals 4. then k equals 5. Let me see how the canceling shakes out now. Um, the negative one-third here can cancel with that positive one-third. The negative one-fourth can cancel with that one-fourth. Ah, the negative one-fifth cancels with that one-fifth. And we have, in this situation, we have one-half. I'm just going to put one one-half here and put the rest in. I have 1 plus 1 half minus 1 sixth minus 1 seventh. Now, it may not be as clear as before. Here, we could use 42 as a common denominator. And let's see what we'd have then. I'd have 1 half Times everything's over 42, so I have 42 over 42 plus 21 over 42 minus 7 over 42 minus 6 over 42. And that will equal 1 half times 63 uh, minus 7 is 56, 50. And there's a lot of simple, a little bit of simplifying I can do here. So that's 25 over 42. That's more than halfway, and that was more than halfway, but this is more than more than halfway. <laughs> so I, I'm not getting a vibe on the numbers. Now, perhaps if I had decimals for all these, but you can see this is extraordinarily time-consuming. But I do notice something. When I added these up, notice what I had here. 
I had what was left was the one and the one half, but then a bunch of stuff canceled, and then what was left? The last two negative pieces. On the next one, look, the first two survive, but the last two disappear, or, or become negative. The first two are positive, the last two are negative. First two and the last two, it did it again. Now, if I do SN this way, let me put the one half here, and we will have one minus one half, actually one minus one third, that's when k was equal to one. Then I'll have one half minus one fourth, and then I'll have one half times one third minus one fifth. Uh, one fourth minus one sixth, and this will go on dot 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 until I get to the last two. Uh, I'll have n minus one. Remember, the next one is always two more than that, and then the last piece will be one over n. Now, you may not be able to see the canceling so much here. Let me rewrite this another way. Let me pull the one half out front and put all the positive ones here. One plus one half plus one third plus one fourth plus one fifth plus. And that went up until I got to one over n. But then let me put in the negative terms. So here I had a negative one third negative one-fourth, negative one-fifth, negative one-sixth. Now, you'll have to bear with me here, but before this term, before this one, there was a one over n minus two minus one over n. That one over n will cancel with that one over n. That one over negative n, that one over n minus one will cancel with things that are two back. So, now the ones that were untouched in all of this were the last two, uh, 1 over n plus 1 and 1 over n plus 2. So between all these, then I see that I can cancel these this, 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 and I'll be left with one half times one plus one half minus one over n plus one minus one over n plus two. Remember, this is s sub n. Does it have a limit? It certainly does. The limit as n goes to infinity of s n will equal uh, uh, the, the limit of a constant is unaffected. So one and one half are not affected by this limit, but this piece here will go to zero. And so will this piece. But wait a minute, this is the limit as n goes to infinity. This equals three fourths. So it actually does, this, this series. So when I add it up, k equals one to infinity, one over k times k plus, one, plus two equals three fourths. Because of all this canceling like this, they refer to a series like this as a telescoping series. And that's because all the middle terms cancel out and you're left with just the end stuff. Now, uh, let me remind you of something that you've had in the past. I'll just put a thing here. This is a recollection, if you will, a recall. There was a way of factoring something like this. The way you did it worked like this. And this goes on and on and on until you get to near the end. 
then you'll have x a to the n minus 2 plus a to the n minus 1. What you ought to notice in here is that every exponent is n minus 1. So like if you took this plus the 1, you get n minus 1. You took this plus the 2, you get n minus 1. 1 plus n minus 2 is n minus 1. n minus 1. So all these are n minus 1s. Okay, that will come in handy for the next thing we're about to work on. And that is this series, k equals 1 to infinity, 1 fifth to the k. Is this a convergent series or does it diverge? By the way, since this had an answer, that series is convergent. Let's take a look and see what happens here. Well, once again, we're going to do s sub n, and that will equal 1 fifth to the 1 plus 1 fifth squared plus 1 fifth cubed plus 1 fifth to the fourth plus dot 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 plus 1 fifth until it gets up to the nth power. Now what I'm going to do is multiply both sides of this equation by 1 minus 1 to the fifth. Notice I'm not really even interested in what these numbers are turning out to be because I know the trick here and my job is to describe the trick to you. So I did it to both sides. Now it just so happens that that series that I had up here that did this, imagine if x is 1 and a is 1 fifth. Then I've got my 1 minus 1 fifth taken care of there. That's like my x minus a. But then here, 1 to the n minus 1, uh, actually let me do one more step. I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm going to factor out 1 fifth. And what will leave me with 1 plus 1 fifth plus 1 fifth squared plus 1 fifth cubed plus 1 fifth to the n minus 1. That's s sub n is equal to that. I, I shouldn't have done this here, so I'm taking that out. And it's right here that I want to do it. 1 minus 1 fifth. Now I'm ready to describe what I was doing. Okay, so x is like the 1. There's my 1. And a is like the 1 fifth. Okay. I have, if you really want to, you could think of this. Well, well let, me, let me go ahead. So x is 1 and a is 1 fifth. So here I got 1 to the n minus 1, which gives me 1. Next, I have 1 to the n minus 2, which always gives you 1, but then the a was 1 fifth, and there's the 1 fifth. So the x's are just 1's the whole time. Let me do that little aside so you can see how it works in here. 1 minus a times 1 plus a plus a squared plus a cubed plus dot dot dot. All the x's are 1 in this scenario. So then when x is replaced with 1, I'll get 1 minus, and the a is a to the n. So that's exactly what I have here. 1 plus a plus a squared all the way up to a to the n minus 1. So I'll get 1 fifth times 1 minus a to the n. Now this over here, 1 minus 1 fifth is 4 fifths. So I have 4 fifths s sub n equals that. Let me make my 5 less like an s. Now I'm going to divide both sides by 4 fifths. So when I do that, 
I'll be left with one fourth, one minus one fifth to the n. Now let me take the limit. Well, this part right here, since this is a number that is smaller than 1, as, you, as it goes to infinity, this piece here will go to 0. So this will equal 1 fourth. The 1 fourth is unaffected. The 1 is, is unaffected. But this piece right here goes to 0. You should recall that from Calc 1. But if you need to, you can do something of a lope call rule here if you need to, to convince yourself. So it equals 1 fourth. So we would say that the summation k equals 1 to infinity, 1 fifth to the k equals 1 fourth. So, or converges the 2 1 fourth. Whatever is your flavor, you can say either one of those things and it would be understood. They're really not afraid to throw this kind of stuff in here at you. k equals 1 to infinity. Here I'll have sine squared of k times pi over 2. <clears throat> so now when I make an s1, when k equals 1, I have sine squared of pi over 2. Well, sine of pi over 2 is 1, so that'll be 1 squared. S2, that'll be 1 squared plus. Now when k is 2, I'll have sine squared of pi, that'll be 0. S3 will equal, uh, I'll have 1 squared plus 0 squared plus, when k is 3, uh, sine of 3 pi over 2 is negative 1. But then when you square it, you'll end up with a 1 again. It looks like I'll have 1 plus 1 will be 2. Then S4 will be 1 squared plus 0 squared plus negative 1 squared plus, now when k equals 4, the 4 is going to cancel here with the 2, and I'll get sine of 2 pi, uh, which would be 0. 0 squared, of course, is still 0. And then S5, I think I have an idea of what this is going to be. I think when I put in k equals 5, 5 pi over 2, sine of that is 1. And I'll bet you that it goes, continues to do that. So my series, for the SNs at least, my partial sums look like this. Looks like I have 1, 1, then 2, 2, then 3, 3, then 4, 4, then 5, 5. Now, it's nice, it has a pattern to it, but the fact is that these terms are unbounded. What that means, then, is that this is just going off to infinity. So we might write something like this. Whatever the case may be, this is considered divergent. So whether the limit exists or is infinite, we consider that to be divergent.